Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear students, it is a great pleasure for us to have Professor Birta Galdikas back with us after a year and a half. I know some of you perhaps were present here then when we had a lecture. But today, today we're going to have a different format. Today we're going to have a conversation. Hopefully. Uh, well, there are very many of us and I hope that all of you have been saving. Um... Do I need that? Okay. <laughs> I thought that I am speaking loud enough. So, okay, once again, dear friends, dear colleagues, everyone, everyone who has gathered here, if you expected a lecture like you know at university, that's not what's going to happen. Today we're here to have a conversation. We're very happy to have Professor Bruta Galdikas with us to talk. And basically, you might have had questions long ago while willing to give them to Professor Bruta Galdikas, thinking about that chance. So the chance has come now. Okay, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself, if there are some people who might not know me. I'm Vice Director for Communication at Vitotas Magnus University, Virma Viekiene, and today I'll help to moderate this conversation. I know how much there is a need of introducing Professor Bruta Galdikas. Well, she is an environmentalist, a primatologist, an anthropologist, but above all, a humanist, and most importantly, a Lithuanian in her origin and in her heart. Believe me, she's really very much with us in her thoughts and always speaks a lot about Lithuania. And I don't know if you know, but Biruta Galikas has so many um, relevant with Vitotas Magnus University, not only because she was given um, the honorary doctoral degree in, in 2010, not only because there is a beautiful um, place with the tree that she planted in the botanical garden of our university, but from the very basics of her education. Birida, you, you got your uh, psychology degree, right? That was the first degree. Right. And then anthropology degree, right? Right. And then she spent all her life taking care of nature. So that is what we want to, to see, to have, and to cherish at Vitoras Manus University, the interdisciplinarity, the broad perspectives that we want to achieve here. So that is what Professor Brita Galdikas embodies with her life, with her attitude. So I think that I'll just give the word to Brita Galdikas, to Professor Brita Galdikas. Um, and while you are thinking of your questions, I would like to ask Brita, so what is there that you would like to share with the students of Vitotas Manus University. What thoughts, what ideas? What ideas? The main idea, and the idea that I'm going to speak about today, and I was hoping to have a conversation, because initially I was told that 20 students would be attending. <laughs> and uh, I don't think there's quite 20 students here, but never mind, I think we can still have a conversation. And so what I have always been interested in, but really uh, did not pursue in my research, is extinction. <coughs> so after 50 years, um, I'm beginning to deal with that issue. And as I told one of the uh, kind journalists that I spoke to earlier, you know, extinction is a very complex matter that has not really been studied. People do not study the process of extinction because there's always been the idea that extinction is something that happens immediately. You know, animals are doing well and then bang, they're extinct. And an example, of course, is a passenger pigeon where in the United States of America, uh, millions of passenger pigeons fill the skies and I think it was the Illinois legislature that actually passed laws against killing passenger pigeons. But by that time, passenger pigeons had long been extinct, but nobody realized it. And so that's the problem, is that we don't actually understand the processes that lead to extinction. And what 
the simile that I use or the analogy that I use is diabetes. Many people get diabetes, but the symptoms are very clear. You know, when you have diabetes, I think you have high blood sugar, I don't know, there are other symptoms. But in reality, many more people have what is called pre-diabetes. And if your doctor is sophisticated enough or is cognizant of these uh, characteristics, he or she will tell you, you know, you have prediabetes. These are the symptoms that you have. And if you don't do something about it, you're going to get diabetes. And most people don't listen. And most people, you know, it doesn't make sense to them. Well, extinction is like diabetes, except extinction is final. It's the end. But there's a long period of time where you're in a pre-extinction state. And so this is one of the things that I am now beginning to study. So one of the reasons that I wanted to have a more uh, conversation-like interaction with students and whoever else who has opinions is to talk about this, to talk about extinction, to talk about how it reveals itself. Because most of the time, it doesn't just happen. It's not like you turn a page in a book and the last page is extinction. It's like there's a whole book preceding it. And at any one of those stages, any one of those pages, we can actually stop it. But we have to be aware of what these stages are. And even scientists don't quite understand it. And the best paper, one of the first papers that I read about the stages of extinction, as measured by field scientists, came out in July of 2022. That's less than a year ago. So this is what I would like to talk about. And it may be boring for most people, but it's a very important issue and it's something that I have invested my whole life, my adult life, preventing the extinction of wild orangutans in Borneo. So this is what I'd like to talk about, a little bit about my orangutan work and also about extinction. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not really an expert on extinction. I'm beginning to understand the process as it occurs among a wild orangutan population. One population that I've been studying now for 50 years. And the signs are clear. But they're subtle. If somebody came to my study area a year ago, they, they wouldn't recognize the signs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like people who fish in Florida. You know, if you see a series of photographs of how big the fish are that um, people catch, then uh, you'd see that 50 years ago, people were, the average fish caught was like this big. And if you look at the photograph now, the average fish caught is this big. So you have to see the series of photographs to understand what is happening. If you just see the photographs from this year, you wouldn't think anything is happening. You'd think that was the typical size of fish. So anyway, so we're in that kind of situation where all kinds of things are happening but they're very subtle, much more subtle than the size of the fish decreasing. Uh, we don't see them. And one of the advantages of having been there for 50 years is I have a timeline. I can compare each year with the preceding year. And I can tell you about the changes that have occurred. And this is what I would like to do. And this is all in the context of my long-term study of orangutan uh, life histories and orangutan ecology and orangutan behavior. So, so thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's uh, what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> right, you mentioned um, extinction and you mentioned also the symptoms that people need to recognize and, and you mentioned also the 50 year that you've been in that field. So. Uh, Professor Berta Garlik has established the or Orangutan uh, Care Center in 1971 in Borneo. And so what were those symptoms? And you mentioned that they are very subtle and you cannot just see them now. You have to really study for a long time. So what are the symptoms about the orangutan? Well, what, how they change? I just published a paper actually just a few days ago and it came out in an Indonesian journal 
and the Indonesians very much appreciate it if foreign, I'm no longer a foreigner, but at least they don't consider me one, but that Indonesian researchers um, publish in Indonesian journals. So this is the second paper that I published in an Indonesian journal. And basically, uh, the title of the paper was, Where Have the Males Gone? But the editor, editors, without letting me know, <laughs> took away that title and made it some, used a subtitle, which is more scientific sounding. But basically, the whole situation is to be summarized in one sentence. Where have the males gone? And if the males disappear, what happens? Well, females can't self-fertilize themselves. They're not lizards. We have a problem, don't we? No males, or very few males. So this is one of the things I'd like to talk about in detail, and uh, I hope we can have somewhat of a conversation. <laughs> so maybe we can start with that question. So where did the males go? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> we, we actually don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is what I'm going to talk about. OK. I'm going to talk about how we discovered this, how we've worked with this, and we have to talk about it in the context of orangutan behavior, orangutan ecology, and orangutan demographics. Mm -hmm. Only then can we answer that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. can, can I begin sure, my talk? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> so I have to hold this, right? I, I can hold it for you. I mean, well, that's... <laughs> we have more than 20 students. So <laughs> no, it's, it's a pleasure to see so many. So um, I just want to say that I'm... Uh, ash so please forgive me, okay? So I have been studying the population of wild orangutans for over 50 years uh, in the Indonesian province of central Indonesian Borneo. And this is one of the longest studies of any wild population in the history of science. It may not be the longest, but it's certainly one of the two longest. So sometimes people ask me, they say, what is it good for? I think it's also the name of a song. <laughs> um, why study a population continuously for 50 years? The answer is that you get a timeline. You get to see change. And what is evolution? Evolution is change. And you have a direct observation of change in an animal population in nature. So you get to see the processes. You get to see the process, not just the result of the process. So you see evolution in action. And if you are unlucky, you may actually see the pre-processes and the process of extinction. And that's what I'd like to talk about now. So let's talk about orangutans. And there are two species in Sumatra and one in Borneo. Orangutans share 97% of their genetic material with us. And one of the interesting things about orangutans is that geneticists tell us that orangutans are actually more closely related to our human ancestors than we are. And that's because orangutans have not changed very much genetically in the last 12 million years, while humans, of course, have totally changed. I mean, we separated from orangutans about, our ancestors separated from orangutans about 12 to 14 million years ago. And then our ancestors separated from the ancestors of chimpanzees about 7 million years ago. But because orangutans did not change, we are less closely related to our ancestors than they are. 
And think about that. Think about what that means. Well, you know, if you're a spiritual person, you might say, yeah, that means they never left the Garden of Eden. And you'd be right. Because they are, one of the things that make them unique is that they are almost totally arboreal. And they, um, that they are the largest arboreal creature on this planet. Um, they also have an extreme degree of sexual dimorphism, and that is males are twice the size of females. They also are unique because they have a unique adaptation, which means that they are solitary or semi-solitary. And of course, one of the characteristics of the primate order to which we belong is that primates are very social. In fact, that's one of the characteristics of human beings. I mean, the worst thing you can do a, to a human being is put him or her in solitary confinement. I mean, that's when people commit suicide. So anyway, so we are social beings. Orangutans are not. So the females are half the size or a third the size of adult males, and males boast uh, flanges or cheek pads at the side of their faces, which indicate that they are now fully adult, fully mature. And they also have large throat pouches, which inflate when they give a call uh, that is unique to them called the long call. And the reason it's called the long call is because it may last for several minutes. And actually, if you've never heard it before, uh, it took me a while to figure out what it was. It sounds like an elephant trumpeting or a lion roaring but it's a complex kind of vocalization. So anyways, males tend to be the most solitary of all age sex classes of the uh, orangutan species, as well as the most terrestrial. So if you encounter an orangutan walking on the ground, the chances are very high that he is going to be an adult male. They walk long distances on the forest floor in Borneo, and it is suggested that they don't do this in Sumatra, because in Sumatra you have terrestrial predators called tigers, which never existed in Borneo. The thing about adult males is that they are almost totally intolerant of each other, and unlike females, adult males are the most solitary of all age classes, and unlike adult females, they do not stay in their mother's home ranges. And in fact, after they become sub-adult sub male, males, they become nomadic. And we don't actually know where orangutan males go or where they come from. Uh, because once they leave the study area, you know, they keep on going. And so I suspect that there are orangutan males who were born in West Borneo who end up dying in East Borneo. And Borneo is not that large um, an island. I mean, it's, you know, it's the third largest island on the planet, but it's only, I don't know, 600 miles wide, which isn't... I mean, California is like 900 miles long. It's not that big. And if you're traveling a few kilometers a year, a few miles a year, you can cross that very easily. So adult males do settle down temporarily, usually, and mate with females in a home range where they are dominant. So if you never attain dominance, you have a problem. And so orangutan males are also known for something called forced copulation, which in human terms is rape. And usually, but not always, usually the, the, you know, the forced, forcible copulators are subadult males or less dominant males. Because the females, not to anybody's surprise, do prefer you know, the large dominant males you know, the ones that give the loudest long call and the ones that keep the other males at bay. So 
the adult male may stay in an area for a certain amount of time. So this period may last up to a few years, but then they move on. And usually they move on once they start losing their dominance. And not one single male that I met in the 1970s is still around. They're all gone. But females that I met in the early 1970s um, are also, most of them started dying about uh, maybe two, three years ago. So the females stay put. And so what you have is you have uh, wild orangutan populations. What you have is you have generations of or generational matrilineal lines of closely related females who stay put permanently in the general areas where they were born. Now, it doesn't mean they were, you know, they, they share their mother's home range. Often they just move when they become fully adult. Uh, they'll establish home ranges peripheral or on the edge of her home range. And you sometimes see adult female orangutans who are quite friendly. And I remember seeing an older female playing with the infant of a younger female. And, you know, I, I hadn't observed the, the birth or anything. So, but I suspected that it was a mother and her mother. So it was a grandmother playing with her infant grandchild. And then when we finally did, or started doing the genetic analyses, uh, we discovered that they were very closely related, so close that they could easily have been mother and daughter. So they are called female Philopatric. Now, the males are different. Different adult males come into these areas, mate with females, and then either eventually or soon move on. So what you have are relatively distinct groups of related males, females, and a roving overlay of temporarily resident males or wandering males. So you basically, in every species of orangutan, <laughs> at least in Borneo, well, there's only one species, but you have subspecies, you know, you have the females who stay put, and then you have males who come in and males who leave. And these are different males. And they probably come from different areas. So, what has happened in the last 50 years? Well, that's what I'd like to talk about. But first, I'd like to talk about extinction. Current theory predicts that certain biological attributes increase vulnerability to extinction. And so one of the characteristics is small populations. If you start with small populations, uh, you're going to have, um, you know, negative effects of, um, in isolation. Uh, well, you know, it's easy to lose the uh, genetic variation through genetic drift. You know, it doesn't have to be extinction, it's just because you're a small population, you're vulnerable. And of course, inbreeding can increase, and that is problematical in terms of losing genetic variability. So small populations are a characteristic of um, species or populations that are vulnerable to extinction. Well, what do we know about orangutans? They're island endemics. They're only found on two islands on this planet. That is Borneo and Sumatra. So island endemics are especially vulnerable to extinction. Large body size. I mean, if you think of what happened at the end of the Pleistocene in North America, you know, all those mammoths and mastodons and gigantic sloths and whatever, all went extinct. Now, there's still argument whether they went extinct because of... Uh, of human predation, you know, because the Clovis and Folsom hunters, you know, 
They came, they came earlier than 10,000, but they were very present at that time, at the end of the Pleistocene, or whether it had to do with climate change and ecological change. Diurnal. Diurnal species tend to go extinct quicker than nocturnal ones. Again, that has to do with nocturnal species generally are better hidden, are better able to hide than diurnal ones. If you have a large home range as an individual, not if you have a large home range as a population, but as individuals. And of course, I've been talking about adult male orangutans. I mean, who knows? You know, they may have home ranges, if you consider where they've been in their lifetimes, of several hundred uh, miles, square miles, or, you know, several hundred square kilometers. So they have a home, large home ranges. And slow life history traits. Well, nobody has uh, slower life history traits than orangutans. I mean, an orangutan female in Tanjung Puting, where I study orangutans, has um, a birth interval of approximately eight years. So she only comes into estrus, so or she only starts recycling, she only wants to become pregnant every eight years. Now, can you imagine how that makes orangutans vulnerable to extinction? You can only have babies once every eight years. They don't have a high tropical level. They're not predators. And they also have complex social structures. And I've mentioned the fact that the females stay put, and then you have an overlay of wandering males. And so there's a disconnect between the males and the females. So if we just look at orangutan natural history, it suggests that they are susceptible to sudden changes in the environment. And of course, the biggest sudden change in some ways, aside from the climatic changes that occurred at the end of the Pleistocene, is the increasing presence of humans. And we know that orangutans or ancestral orangutans lived in what is now southern China and Indochina, and that those orangutans became uh, extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. And, you know, it could have been climatic, but it also could have been that the populations in those areas gained, um, you know, started using bows and arrows, started using, you know, spears with, what do you, what do you call them? Spear throwers. So, who knows? But it's easy to go extinct. Now, there are very few documentations of, or de, of the process of extinction. You know, people say, well, you know, the Tasmanian tigers went extinct. You know, we know that the last Tasmanian tiger, I think, died in a zoo like in 1933. We know the Balinese tiger went extinct. You know, we know what, when animals went extinct. We also know sometimes what happened just immediately before they went extinct. But we actually don't know the whole process. Like I said, people assume that extinction is like, you know, turning the page of a book. Not quite that easy. So one of the best descriptions of a bird that went extinct is the heath hen. So what happened with the heath hen? You know, they're a terrestrial, more or less, bird. And they lived in New England, more or less. And uh, they were nearly hunted to extinction. And so a reserve was created. And by this time, they were virtually extinct. And so the the U.S. Fish and Game Agency, which was, had been created around that time, uh, paid attention. And they started counting them, and they started observing them. And then in 1915 uh, or so, a fire swept through their reserve. Now, unfortunately, the reserve was the only place where they were found. 
As far as anybody knew, they were extinct in the areas outside the reserve. And then, you know, while their population was down, disease struck. And so some kind of bird flu was introduced into the general area by turkeys. People started keeping turkeys in the area. And you can see from the graph, their population went down and it never recovered. And I think it was sometime in the late 20s or early 1930s that the U.S. Fish and Game Service captured the last Heath hen. And they didn't know what to do with him. <laughs> this is one left. There were no female Heath hens. They, they tried to mate him with you know, other hens. So it didn't work. So what could they do? Well, they did the honorable thing. They released him back to the wild, and he died in the wild. So this is the best documentation of what happens, of the process of how a species goes extinct. And part of it was that they only had one reserve. You know, tiny population, you know, stricken by fire, and then disease, and it was over. So over the 50 years that I have been working in Tanjung Puding National Park in central Indonesia and Borneo, I have noticed that a number of populations have either gone extinct or decreased. And it seemed for about 30 or 40 years that the leeches went extinct. I mean, compared to the first few years that I was in Borneo, I mean, it was horrific. I mean, I had... You know, I'd come home to camp after spending a day in the forest, and I would have leeches, you know, practically, you know, in my underwear and on my neck. <laughs> it was like, it was unbelievable. It was horrible. And, of course, sometimes those leech bites would get infected, you know, and I, I've often said that if it wasn't for antibiotics, I, you know, I wouldn't be here. But they recently have made a recovery, and we don't have the same number of leeches that we used to have, but we still have some leeches now. And I, I hadn't seen a leech like 30 years. And I know it wasn't just me, because I remember years ago, one of my Dayak indigenous assistants, who was not an intellectual heavyweight, he mentioned to me, he said, have you noticed that the leeches are gone? I said, yes, you're right. I mean, he validated my own impression. You know, and when an indigenous person validates your own impression, you know that impression is right. Because they really do understand the forest. The oriental daughters are gone. Period. When I first went to Borneo, you know, you'd go every few hundred meters, you'd find an oriental daughter on a tree branch overlooking the river. Gone. Broadbills and their nests are far less. They haven't quite disappeared, but almost. It's rare to see a nest um, these days, and um, they build the nests over the river and branches over the river. And you have invasive African snails have come and gone. So when I first came there, I didn't realize they were invasive. So for the first, you know, few months, I collected the shells, <laughs> and it turned out they were actually from Africa. And they disappeared. And I don't know what's happened, but in the last few years, I haven't seen many of them, but I have seen them occasionally. So something's happening. And then I wanted to mention that um, there used to be rhinoceros in Tanjung Puting. And I came in 1971, and the last rhinoceros in our province was seen in 1949. So when I went to Tanjung Puting initially, the local people would show me wallows, mud wallows. And they'd say, these are not pig wallows. These are wallows that were used by, uh, by the rhinoceros. And the last rhinoceros was killed in our province when an indigenous Dayak hunter was chasing what he thought was a pig. Now, the Asian rhinoceros, they uh, are called Sumatran 
are about this high. And there are pigs that are that high. So he was chasing what he thought was a pig, and he hit the pig, what he thought was a pig, with his poison blowgun dart, which is what the indigenous use. But then when he came to the uh, pig carcass, to his shock and surprise, he discovered it was a rhinoceros. And that's the record of the last rhinoceros killed in our province, 1949. They still exist in Saba, North Borneo, and a little bit, a few, in East Borneo. And it was a population that was recently discovered, actually, but I think after that, they were all killed anyways. So Tanjung Puting, where I work, it's a national park, has become surrounded by palm oil, and recent development. Palm oil concessions, where there used to be ancient forest. And you can see the palm oil concessions in Indonesia. Uh, these areas, the coastal areas, and the, this is the mountain bridge of uh, Borneo. So these areas are difficult to plant palm oil uh, because palm oil will not survive above, it won't survive in mountainous areas, survive in hills, but over a thousand uh, feet, it doesn't do very well. So, and of course, palm oil concessions in Borneo are one of the main reasons why orangutan populations are declining in size, and you are getting increasingly fragmented forests. And so this is the prediction that was made in 2015 that additional forests would be lost by 2020, and it's actually quite true. Those predictions worked out. And you can see that Borneo has limited protected areas. And you can see that most orangutans actually live, or many orangutan populations uh, live in areas where uh, there is no protection. And that some protected areas don't have orangutans especially in the, this mountainous ridge here. Of course, people like to protect areas that have limited commercial value or are inaccessible. And this, is, this ridge is quite inaccessible here. I think the large, actually the largest mountain, the tallest mountain in Borneo is here, Mount Kinabalu, and I think it's about 13,000 feet which is pretty high, for Asia anyways. And another thing is that wild orangutans used to be rare at feeding stations. So we have released a number of wild-born ex-captive orangutans um, in Tanjung Puting National Park, as well as a total of 14 feeding stations throughout the area, most of which are not in the park. And those areas are, uh, when you go to uh, Borneo to see the orangutans and Tanja Puting, uh, those are public areas, but the other areas are not public. So people don't really see them. Okay, so we're gonna leave this here. And I'm going to talk about, what? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the kinds of um, the kinds of predictions that my co-authors and I made because we noticed I noticed that something was happening, and this pattern of an overlay of wandering males and permanent female matrilines is something that we noticed in the 1970s. So it's probably the natural 
sort of ecology of wild orangutan populations in the province. And when we did a genetic study in 2016, we expected a certain number of uh, predictions. And the first one was that relatedness among female philanthropic lineages was going to be higher than relatedness among adult males who are the dispersing sex. You know, so if the adult males are coming from different areas, they're not going to be closely related, but the females who stay put are going to be closely related. So these adult or flanged males with cheek pads who move into the area should be unrelated or less related or not related to the females when compared to others in the area. So relatedness among some adult unflanged males who have not yet dispersed should actually be uh, close to that of the females in the area. And so their relatedness should be higher than the relatedness of adult males who are moving in. Now, the second prediction was that genetic diversity among full, uh, hello, Patrick, female groups exhibiting polygyny, which is what orangutans exhibit. Orangutans are basically very promiscuous, both males and females. I remember once watching a female orangutan mate with a male, adult male, and then she meandered over maybe 200, no, maybe about about three, 300 meters, 400 meters, I followed her. And within half an hour, she made it, made it with a second male, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think the two males were aware of each other's presence. And of course, I've seen uh, adult male orangutans consorting with a female, an adult female, and then they see another female in the distance I've only seen this once. Normally they don't do this, but I, I saw it once. He rushed over, forcibly copulated that second female, and then went back to the first female. <laughs> so, trust me, they're promiscuous. <laughs> the females should actually show what is called um, heterozygosity or hydrozygosity uh, excess. In other words, they should have more of it than the males. And they should also have a negative inbreeding coefficient. Despite the fact that they're closely related and stay in the same area, uh, all these males coming through, you know, up their heterozygosity. <laughs> and so the more breeding males that come into the area, the more heterozygosity is kept up within the full and Philopatric female groups. So if there are sufficient breeding males in the area, then the females should show higher um, heterozygosity excess and more negative um, inbreeding. And then the third thing is that um, if the males are migrating from far distances, which we assume they might be, uh, the males might have a higher observed heterozygosity and more allelic richness, more genetic richness, maybe more rare alleles than the local philopatric females. So those are the three expectations that we basically had when we looked at the genetics of the female and male orangutans in 2016, but I already was aware of the fact that the males had disappeared. So in 2016, during the six months that my student did her genetic studies, there were only two adult males. But in 1971 to 1975, we found, I found, adult males 64 times. 
So compare 64 times, or actually per month, it was sometimes as many as 40 males, um, compared to two. So clearly something was going on. And you can see that most of the uh, times that we located animals, they were solitary. And that there were a combination of age sex classes. So basically, if we look at 1971 to 1975, male orangutan encounter rates were very high. What does our 50-year research show us? And it shows us that the males are no longer there. Where have the males gone? Male encounter rates have declined over 50 years. And you can see the um, adult fledged males, so the orange group, males in general, which is the group. And then the interesting thing is the sub adult males have also decreased. But in 2016, they started going up a little bit. So we encountered in 1976. Uh, there were four of us collecting data, and we encountered adult and sub-adult males 40 times, of which 25 were flanged males. In 170 search follow days over the six-month period of February to August of 1976, this was the largest number of males encountered in all the time periods sampled. And then the total number of males monthly encounters uh, decreased to 35, of which 21 were flanged males. Okay, so this decline is particularly evident when adjusted for search effort. So this graph shows male orangutan encounters per effort day. So you can see that in 1976, uh, when our days were not so high in terms of search effort, because there were only a few of us, mainly me and my former husband. Um, and then you see in 1986, when the uh, search efforts shot up, but the number of males that we found was much less. And then the trend continued in 1996, and then in 2006, it dipped. And in 2016, it looked like it had gone up, but it didn't really. Because during February to August of 2016, we only found two adult males. But we did find, I think it was four sub-adults. This is why the, the graph went up but the number of adult males had gone way, way down. And then we did a genetic survey in 2016, and flanged males were not related to each other. No relationship, zero. But they were related to subadults and females. So what that indicated is that the sub, sorry, the adult males had not come from distant places. The adult males had come from areas close to where uh, the adult females lived. They were genetically related. And the sub-adult males were even more closely related to each other and also to the adult females. And then, of course, the adult females were uh, most closely related to each other. So, where have the males gone? Well, clearly there's been a behavioral shift. And unfortunately, we were only able to do uh, the genetic analyses in 2016. I had collected samples. I've been collecting genetic samples for, you know, since I first started my research, but, you know, I'm not a geneticist. You know, so. Well, I didn't collect fecal samples. I collected hair samples, but 
you know, you need the hair bulb. You know, you can't just, although we did have a few um, samples of hair that had fallen from the males or we got from old nests, so. Well, anyways, like I mentioned, um, in July, Oh, it was published, this one was published, uh, actually there was another one that was published by Chirini and his co-authors, and this one was published just less than half a year ago, and this is a predictive timeline of wildlife population collapse. And when you have wildlife population collapse, what it basically means is that it's the easy way to extinction. So what are some of these Signposts. Well, behavior shift is the first one. And guess what we have at Tanjung Puting? Morphological traits shift. Abundance shifts. And then there's an abundance drop, and then there's extinction. So we argue that before the behavioral shift, you also have a genetic shift. And orangutans are very long-lived, so you know, you're not going to get the morphological trait shift very quick. They said it takes eight years, you know, between birth intervals, and orangutans live, you know, easily into their 60s, although probably the males don't do quite as well. And so you're not going to see these things very early, but it's clear that we have a behavioral shift and we also have a genetic shift. And the genetic shift is that the adult males are basically local boys. They're not coming from afar. Tanjung Puting National Park is on the Tanjung Puting Peninsula. And so these males, the two adult males, are probably from the peninsula itself, although they're not from the park. And the other males, the sub-adult males, are local boys who have not left. In fact, two of them were siblings. And the older sibling was about 18 years of age. And under normal circumstances, we suspect that he, he would already have begun his nomadic wanderings, but he hadn't. So behavioral shift has happened and a genetic shift has happened. And the genetic shift is that the males present in 2016 and probably likely now, are local boys. So something major has happened. So all this happened uh, during the 50 years when my staff and I became much more efficient at locating wild orangutans. And yet, even though we became more efficient, couldn't find them. And we also noticed that uh, we stopped hearing long calls which are the giveaway sign of uh, local orangutans. So, so where have the males gone? Well, we think, we're not sure, but we think that they left. To the zoo. I'm sorry? To the zoo. To the zoo. Yes. <laughs> could be. It easily could be. Uh, they left and uh, they can't come back. And so uh, in, the, in the 70s, I noticed an adult male who disappeared, and then seven years later, he came back for a short time, and then he disappeared again. So, I mean, this is a pattern that we were seeing in the 70s and the 80s, and that pattern stopped. And because the males that we were able to genetically sample in 2016 our local boys, especially the sub adult males, they're not leaving because they can't get out. And why can't they get out? Because the whole area to the north, northeast, west east is surrounded by palm oil plantations. And when you go through a palm oil plantation, it's a kill trap because, uh, you know, 
we're working. We have education programs. We have conservation programs. We're, you know, trying to stop it. We have to a certain extent. But the palm oil concessionaires and mainly the laborers who work in the palm oil concessions consider orangutans as pests, even though it's against the law. So, so can we have a conversation? <laughs> Um, you mentioned the example of a male um, which left and then tried to come back. And I was just wondering, did have you noticed any changes um, to the dynamics of social dominance in general? So over these 50 years that you have been studying, did you observe any um, yeah, dynamics or changes to the so social dominance? And as you said, there is the a male that is um, this... Uh, Am I right, alpha male, who is actually the lead? Thank you. Uh, there are fewer males. Just so if there are fewer males, they don't fight. Okay. Yeah. And have I noticed any difference in the dynamics? I have. But I'm really, I don't want to discuss it because we haven't, you know, done any analysis of it. Uh, the females are fighting more. Okay. Especially the wild-born ex-captive females. I mean, we have noticed that there is a difference. And a few years ago, something happened that I, I wouldn't have believed, except it happened in a scientific study. It was you know, observed by people who were legitimate scientists, researchers, and that is an, a sub-adult male and a young female orangutan in the wild killed an older female, actually killed her. And there was a whole description of the process. And, you know, if you told me before that this would happen, I, would, I wouldn't have believed you. Could this suggest that other behavioral shifts happening that is, we that, don't understand at all? That, that's what I think. And there were no uh, wild-born ex-captive orangutans involved. There was no rehabilitation pro program in that area. It was just something that happened in the wild. So, obviously, shifts are occurring. And this is a problem. But the only reason we've been able to observe it in our area is because I've been there 50 years. I mean, if somebody came in, as I said earlier, you know, saw two adult males there and four sub-adult males, they'd say, well, this is a normal situation, but it's not. So the behavioral shifts, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're going to look more carefully at the long-term data and try to figure out more. Yeah. It's very sad, actually. Yes? So thanks very much for a very insightful and thought-provoking uh, talk, first of all. I have one very straightforward question and another one more complex. So the straightforward one is who funds your research? Because it's amazing that you're able to do this for 50 years. The more complex one is, though, as a fellow scholar, it's like I'm amazed genuinely. Uh, the more complex one is just a pure curiosity, and it also relates to the social dynamics. Uh, I'm curious uh, if the males, if the males have always historically been nomadic, what was the reason, do you think, for the female to choose a dominant male if he is not going to be there to protect her? And uh, right now, like, uh, what would you say would be the key? I don't know, attributes of being an attractive male now that this dynamic is changing in the small population that you're observing. Because if they're fighting less, then maybe dominance is further losing significance. But I, I was genuinely intrigued. Like, what is the reason to choose, like, specifically the most physically strong male if the male won't be to protect you, if, if you will be raising the child alone anyway? Were there no other traits that the female would be inclined to prefer aside from physical strength? Thank you. Thank you. Interesting question. I think if you are a dominant male and you mate with a female, what you do, you may not directly protect her, but when you are dominant, you give the long call every day and you patrol that area and what you do is you keep the other males at bay. That's what you do inadvertently. I mean, I think they're conscious of keeping other males at bay but the female is, all the females are safer, although forced copulations by adult males, as far as I have seen in the wild, never lead to injury of the female. I mean, they really are not interested 
in attacking her. They're not interested in harming her. They're just interested in mating with her. And once they're finished, it's like both of them lay back and have a cigarette. <laughs> I, mean, no, I mean, like there's no hostility between them, you know, because it's all about mating. It's not about aggression or dominance. You know, basically, uh, I met another researcher who had worked with orangutans in East Borneo, and he was convinced that female orangutans that are half or the third the size of male orangutans were dominant over them because he'd actually seen instances where, you know, a female and her infant, her infant was maybe a meter away from her, were feeding in the same tree as an adult male orangutan. And he described one instance in which the female plucked her infant, you know, from the branch above, put the infant on her side, and then charged the adult male along the branch, and the adult male jumped out of the tree. But, you know, why should he bother? Why should he bother fighting a female? Makes no sense. Because he wants to mate with her. He doesn't want to be dominant over her. You know, so I, I think, as I said, the dominant male has a function. And probably they do attract, I mean, they do consider him attractive. Because if you have survived to adulthood, and you, that means, and gotten the cheek pads, the throat pouch, the large, size, the musculature, that means that you must be genetically very fit. Because orangutans die from wounds, they die from falls, they die from snake bites, I mean, they die from all sorts of things. You know, so just the fact you've survived. And interestingly enough, the reverse works. You know, in human societies, um, you know, men like teenagers and young women, right? They've done studies on this. <laughs> but um, in orangutan societies, guess who they prefer? The older, the better. And, I mean, I have seen adult male orangutans fight over females that we would consider, if you look at them, sort of decrepit. I remember one who could barely sort of walk. <laughs> And that's because they see that particular female had an adolescent son. You know, she was no longer fertile, so she hadn't had new infants. And so he just stuck with her. Um, and, uh, oh my gosh, the males were crazy about her. <laughs> well, they thought, she's a producer, right? And I have seen adult male orangutans actually push away adolescent females who wanted to mate with them. And in one case, I remember, um, he was eating, and she was doing all kinds of things to attract his attention. And I won't even mention them, because there are children in the audience. But, <laughs> but um, he bit her. And so she raced out of the tree, and then she stood in an adjacent tree and squealed for at least three or four minutes in indignation, like, why did you reject me? Well, the answer was, you're not old enough. And adolescent females, also in humans, suffer from adolescent sterility. So it's much harder for a teenager to become pregnant than it is for a woman in her 20s, at least in humans. Yeah, so orangutans do not waste their effort. Well, because they're fruit eaters, so it's very hard to get a lot of calories in if all you eat is fruit and leaves. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. I don't have any questions, just a comment five months ago. Uh, me and my husband had a chance to travel in Indonesia, and we visited Borneo, and in Tan Tanjung Puting uh, Center, we've met Berute. Uh, so, it was amazing feeling to see how local people respect and loved Berute, 
It makes me proud that I'm Lithuanian too. She saved a huge amount, huge area of the beautiful jungles. And I saw not only how rangers wait you with a speedboat in the river, but as well like orangutans came from the bushes like to beloved mother <laughs> because you saved them. Thank you, Burita, very much. I have very much considered myself fortunate that I work in Borneo, in Indonesian Borneo, and that um, um, my, my family basically has become Indonesian. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm very grateful to the Indonesian government because they've given me a number of awards. Uh, they've given me some of the higher, actually they've given me the highest award, environmental award in Indonesia, and I was the first non non-ethnic Indonesian uh, to win some of those awards. So, yeah, I, I feel what you describe about the respect and even love, I also feel for, for Indonesians, particularly the indigenous Dayaks of Borneo. Yeah, thank you so much for your comment. <laughs> it's very nice. I wanted to ask about uh, offsprings. Uh, you mentioned that where the males have gone, I also wanted to ask if uh, newborn males also are becoming more rare than the female ones. Is it uh, also a problem there for the extinction? So I haven't calculated it in recent years, but my impression is that the males, male infants have always seemed to be more prevalent than female infants. And if you have that particular kind of uh, social system, you know, where the males go and the females stay, um, an orangutan female in the wild probably will not give birth to more than five, maximum five infants, more, more likely four infants in her lifetime. But if you are a nomadic male and you are dominant and you grow to full adulthood, you know, you could easily have 10 offspring. So it makes sense in those kinds of societies for the male-female ratio to be, you know, not be 50-50. I mean, that's what the sociobiologists say anyways. But I, I believe it. I believe it. And it looks like it's hard to count these issues, you know, how many males versus how many female infants are born in a year because sometimes, in many years, none are born. Because the female only gives birth once every 7.8 years on average. It's an interesting question. Thank <laughs> you. Jūsų skirta Vilniaus universitete, kad kas nuvyktų į Borneo ir jums padėtų dirbti šitą gamto sauginį darbą, kurį jūs dirbate? Ar veikianti tą stipendiją? Well, we don't have a scholarship now. What we do have is actually uh, a small stipend for Indonesian students, especially of indigenous heritage, but we don't discriminate about heritage. But I would very much like to have you know, an Indone uh, sorry, a Lithuanian student come, and we've had Lithuanian volunteers come. And, you know, that's been very gratifying. Thanks. I would just have one question on the more um, global trend, whether you have been able to compare maybe the trend of the uh, um, males leaving to, um, to the ones in Sumatra, for example. The researchers there, have they also... Um, uh, established certain trends like that so that it's more global or whether it's just more localized in Borneo, uh, the fact that the males are leaving and not coming back? Well, the problem with the Sumatran studies is that there hasn't been one particular principal investigator who's been there for 50 years, and the investigators come and go. But I'm sure if they collated their data, they, they would find similar trends. But, you know, you need genetic data, too. So I was very fortunate that uh, I had a student who uh, was, for her master's degree, was 
willing to do the genetic studies, you know, for me or with me. I mean, I didn't do any genetic studies, but I collected, I collected samples. You know, that's the main thing. So you have to have the data. Yeah, thank you. Well, you said that um, uh, those um, have, have those um, uh, areas that are um, safe from deforestation or from human um, uh, activities uh, are not so big. So, if if that those areas uh, would uh, be spread, would it be uh, better for orangutans? Would uh, males? Be, not become, but would they uh, come back? How that? Uh, um, well, what what we're doing just to, uh, is we are trying to establish corridors. Mm -hmm. So we are very fortunate that we have been able, with our Indonesian allies, to uh, buy land, buy forested land. So we actually have bought about. 6,000 hectares in Indonesia, uh, where we have reforested. Some of it is land adjacent to forests that burned down due to the great fires of 2015 and 2019. So in the last six years, I think it's the last six years, we have planted over 800,000 uh, seedlings of native trees. And we've done it with uh, a team of eight indigenous people. I mean, they just plant and plant and plant and collect and collect. And, and so we hope to achieve maybe a million trees planted, maybe not by the end of this year, but the end of 2024. And we also have an education program where we have in the last, I think it's six, seven years, we have spoken to 70,000 local children, teachers, and villagers. So in addition to the wild orangutan research, uh, we also rehabilitate orangutans, we buy land, we protect land, oh, and we do patrols. Another thing that we do is we patrol. And uh, with the police, and we work with the mobile brigades of the Indonesian police, which are the equivalent of SWAT teams. It's all legal. <laughs> no, it's all legal. And um, so we do a lot of things. It's not, not just following wild orangutans. But, but that's the heart and soul of what we do. And it's also the heart and soul of what enables local people to really appreciate our work is because they see that our love of orangutans and our work to protect them is genuine. It all comes from the heart. And then it comes from their hearts too. So we're very fortunate. I mean, I really feel lucky that, um, um, that um, uh, I went to Indonesia. I was, I was initially wanting to go to Malaysia, but Instead, I ended up in Indonesia. And then one more thing, one last note. You know, my mentor was Louis Leakey. I waited three years to go to Southeast Asia to study orangutans. And Louis Leakey said to me, in one of our last meetings, he said, and I will remember his exact words, he said, so it will be pygmy chimpanzees then, which was the name for bonobos, you know, 50, 55 years ago. And I said, no, I said, let's just wait a little bit and maybe the permissions will come from Indonesia. And we didn't get permission, but we got a positive response. So I went to Indonesia and I, I look back and think of the terrible things that have happened in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It would have been so much worse to work with bonobos. I mean, I'm glad that other people are doing it. But I really feel I was very, very lucky that I ended up in Indonesia, working with orangutans. <laughs> and I think that we are very lucky to have you with us, Virute. And I believe that the students who have been listening today have already uh, learned some of the career path that you may take. 
uh, that might lead to Indonesia, and there is a lot of work to do. Um, right, and a lot of helping too. hands that yeah. could be necessary there. So, if somebody wants to to go to Indonesia to help as a volunteer. Uh, to help the Rute in different kind of activities. We can also think about scholarships. I mean, you mentioned the scholarship that could be established. Uh, so we could also think about different scholarship that could be established for, for, for those who want to go there and to help. And um, um, I want to say one more thing. Sure. And that is that uh, if you need more information, please go to our website, which is orangutan.org. There's lots of information there. So. Please go to it. And then I also have a Twitter account, Dr. Birate, and I also have an Instagram account, Dr. Birate. So I, I, I try to, you know, talk about orangutans and issues. And the other thing I want to say, and I think this is important for me to say it, I apologize, <laughs> I keep talking, but I, I do want to say that my uh, Baltic culture, and my parents, of course, were Lithuanian, and that that really established a love of nature. I mean, my father actually would walk out his back door, put out his hand, and wild birds would actually come and sit and eat the breadcrumbs on his hand. I mean, that's how close he was to nature. This is in Los Angeles. So, so I'm very proud of my Lithuanian heritage and my Baltic heritage, and uh, I very much appreciate uh, the support and help that I have received from Lithuania and Lithuanians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're also very much appreciative. Thank you. That you, you keep coming to us, keep um, giving us all the expertise, sharing with us your expertise. And, um, well, you came to Lithuania, to our university in 2021, and then you missed a very important year, 2022. And that was the centennial year of our university. We celebrated 100 years of our um, establishment, of the establishment of the University of Lithuania um, in those times. And our university uh, produced um, the special um, awards, oh. the Centennial Medals, oh. for the most important people, for our best friends, for, for those who we really cherish. So, Viruta, uh, on behalf of our community, of Vitoz Mayas University community, on behalf of the rector, I would like to give you this, this, um, this Centennial Award. Oh, well, how kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.